Well, good morning. It's um, great to be here today, and um, I um, especially like teaching students, and um, I teach a course at NYU in molecular modeling, and um, I particularly enjoy an interdisciplinary group of students because we can um, learn in the class from each other from people's perspectives. Students come from physics to biology, chemistry, mathematics to um, the field of molecular modeling. And I believe you're also a group with diverse backgrounds. So, um, so this, this is what makes the field exciting for both uh, novices and experts who were experienced in the field, but the fresh perspective is always wonderful. Um, today I'm going to give you a very brief tutorials on two broad fields. Um, the first lecture will be on Monte Carlo methods, and the second lecture will be on optimization methods, minimization uh, methods that, that are very important for modeling and although they are not as prominent as all the other uh, techniques, namely molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo simulations are very important and they can solve certain problems and certainly one can integrate Monte Carlo methods with molecular dynamics in hybrid Monte Carlo and other sampling um, techniques. And Optimization methods, of course, are very important even when you do <coughs> a molecular dynamic simulation is you have to start from a good structure uh, free of stir clashes um, and also minimization by itself can be very important when you have many possible structures such as in our group uh, 
a graduate student is studying carcinogen DNA adducts and there are multiple orientations so you can't assume that uh, the equilibration phase in molecular dynamics will relax or sample all the possible orientations and of these unusual structures and that's why minimization is very important. So um, in, in the first lecture on Monte Carlo simulations, I will uh, give some very brief, m mention the brief, um, briefly the some three key points in Monte Carlo methods, namely um, Metropolis Monte Carlo sampling and uh, pseudo-random number generators and in general the importance of Monte Carlo means and error bars. And um, Monte Carlo simulation, I, I like this quote from politics, it is a pollster's maximum that the truth lies not in any one poll but in the center of gravity of several poles and that's very important for modeling as well. We do long dynamic trajectories and often we get stuck in one region of phase space but Monte Carlo methods can be very important uh, for example to, s to sample large floppy systems like DNA um, where Monte Carlo and Brownian dynamics simulations have been very important. Um, <coughs> if you remember the uh, rocky presidential elections in uh, 2000, those of you who are here between Bush and Gore, um, there, was, there was a statement by a mathematician in the New York Times who said, um, I wouldn't believe any, um, any, any race whose margin of error is greater than the margin of victory no matter who wins. And, um, that, that was indeed the case with the Gore and, um, and Bush, but, um, but that's all history now. Um, so Monte Carlo simulations involve random sampling of problems formulated as stochastic phenomena. So the, the, the sampling is very simplistic, but actually the rules that are applied to get the means, the errors, and so on rely on very solid um, theorems in probability, stochastic process, statistical physics, and um, so on. And that is what lends the field so much utility. Um, there are numerous applications in numerical integration, especially in high dimensions. Monte Carlo techniques are used in global optimization, queuing theory, um, many systems of um, large systems of linear partial integral equations. Uh, averages, financial modeling, it's very important to model all the possible chaotic events that, that happen that affect the stock market, um, statistical physics, and um, a good theoretical grounding is important to, to apply Monte Carlo and to interpret the results. So very briefly in the lecture um, that I have, and I think you have reading materials from um, chapter 10 in, in the book that, that Klaus just mentioned, so there's, you can read more details there. Um, all I want to, to cover a few of these, not all of these topics, um, but basically what a Monte Carlo mean is, the importance of the error bars, um, and the important method of Metropolis Monte Carlo sampling, uh, some issues of that and the application of umbrella sampling, um, that's, that's an important technique. And then I want to mention something about pseudo-random number generators, which, which is something I think more people need to appreciate because, uh, especially because so many of the popular molecular mechanics and dynamics codes do not use, uh, as far as I know, um, really state-of-the-art pseudo-random number generators and when you're doing very long runs they're, they're and using the um, random numbers you can you can get into um, certain problems. So um, let me just watch watch the time and, and feel free to to interrupt me I will try to end um, 10 minutes early so there there could be questions but if there's a, an important question you want to ask me during uh, please feel free to. 
So um, Monte Carlo simulations, there are very early records in, uh, in the 18th century and um, needle throwing experiments. La Laplace used Monte Carlo methods to estimate pi and I'll, I'll, let, I'll show you um, what the, the es essentially the program that he used. Uh, Lord Kelvin used it for the kinetic theory of gases. And um, so there have been all these sporadic applications, but the modern era really began with the Los Alamos pioneers, um, von Neumann, Fermi, Ula, Metropolis, Teller, and um, many others who um, formulated problems in terms of probability and solved them by using stochastic sampling. And the Metropolis algorithm now is, is very important in many applications in molecular uh, studies. And of course, Monte Carlo gained um, importance as computer speed and uh, became more available. There's still um, the usual argument of whether m when you're talking about very large system, Monte Carlo methods are effective or mo molecular dynamics are effective. And it really depends on the system, the, um, the ratio of inertial to <coughs> Um, to diffusive terms, uh, importance, and, the, um, and the, the question you're asking from simulations. But it is known that certainly when you're, as, as the system complexity and size grows, Monte Carlo um, can be effective in, in certain applications. So just, just to review a very basic thing, when the idea is that simply if you want to evaluate an expected value or mean of, of say, a, a certain property A, and A is defined over some domain D, then um, essentially if it's a continuous uh, quantity, you, you define it as, as the integral in this way. And if um, it's a discrete, we have this discrete estimate, which is called Y, um, that's the, the average here over n sample points, and we simply average A over um, all the points that we have. And of course, this becomes more and more accurate as the number n increases. And uh, then if you plot the average over um, the sample number, then the cumulative average should um, approach should plateau and approach the quantity um, you're trying to compute. The variance of that quantity is also very important because it measures the, uh, the error of distribution about that mean. And um, that's defined in this way. This is the for a discrete approximation. And therefore, it's important to report um, an estimate of this quantity y as this value, this mean value, plus um, this, um, this error or the standard deviation. And uh, so, for example, the classic thing, if you have 10,000 sample points, um, the result is at best 1% accurate. And that's assuming the data is correlated and your sampling is free of biases. And um, of course, when you have correlated data, there are more sophisticated techniques than the simple averaging. And they involve batch means. And often um, in molecular dynamics, we use these means. We average quantities that we obtain during the molecular dynamic simulation. And it's important to test for the correlation in the chunks of data. Otherwise, you could be just um, measuring, measuring the, the error would not really reflect the, um, the, the quality of the data. So what is Metropolis Monte Carlo algorithm? I think you're very familiar with this, so I can go over this quickly. But the idea is to generate a conformation ensemble that obeys Boltzmann statistics. So in other words, we sample uh, configuration space. And here I'm talking about molecules, since that's what mostly um, you're interested in. But of course, this can apply to anything. And 
in, um, in this case, we want to not just sample things at random, but rather focus on important regions of conformation space um, that are more energetically favored or thermally accessible. So um, that is done by the Boltzmann statistic that the probability of sampling a particular um, energy value is proportional to this uh, Boltzmann factor, um, to this exponential factor. And therefore, if you have um, two, two quantities, there's the, uh, if this is a delta E, this is one energy value if you imagine here, and this is another configuration with this energy, and uh, this, this is the uh, probability of the, the energy change over here. That's what the uh, Boltzmann statistics curve looks like. Now, in order to apply the Monte Carlo, Metropolis Monte Carlo method, you need essentially um, a way to model transitional probabilities. In other words, you need to move from one configuration to another, x to x prime in a, in a reasonable way. Um, you need to ensure ergodicity, that is that you sample all of phase space in this limit of number of samples goes to infinity. Um, detailed balance, that the, if you go from point x to x prime, you're just as likely to return to x from x prime. And uh, efficiency also of, of the sampling process. So it doesn't, if you have a lot of rejections because the energy is too high, that can be a very inefficient uh, Monte Carlo um, process. So these are the, in theory, what we require in order to apply such a method. And um, in, in practice, we can't really prove all these issues rigorously, but we, um, we use techniques that, that at least are known and are believed to satisfy those requirements. So um, here is just the uh, summary, the Metropolis um, algorithm. So essentially in the canonical ensemble, uh, constant uh, NVT, uh, volume, temperature, and particle number, we, we do this mean. And essentially, um, we need for the computer implementation, we need a pseudo-random number generator, which, which I'll um, discuss a little later. Uh, we need a move, a perturbation, to um, yield a new configuration, x prime from x. And here I've described if this is a DNA chain, we use um, Metropolis, Monte Carlo, and uh, simulations of uh, long DNAs. And um, a perturbation may, may consist of a translational move and a rotational move where you actually pick a segment and uh, you, you can either rotate the um, orientation or you can, what a more sophisticated move such as actually take a segment over here, put it somewhere else. And, um, and again, you have to parameterize these moves very carefully so that you have a reasonable energy for the candidate move and not, um, not completely um, unreasonable. And uh, in typical programs, like at least I, I know Charm very well, and the Monte Carlo moves are usually translational um, perturbations or rotational of atoms, the Cartesian coordinates of the atoms. Um, and of course, then you need a definition of a potential energy function in, in your program. So the, the process is essentially as follows. Um, so you have a starting point and you generate a new point from the given point by a perturbation technique that, as we discussed, should satisfy detailed balance. Um, compute the energy difference from the old point um, with respect to the energy of the new point. If it's a downhill move, that is if the energy decreases, you always accept. So that means that the new, um, new sample point is the uh, candidate. And if, if it doesn't, if, if in other words, if you're going uphill in energy landscape, you set the probability to this uh, Boltzmann factor 
And then you generate a random number between 0 and 1, and which I'll dis discuss how to do that later. And if, um, if the probability is greater than that, you accept. If it's not, you reject. And then you continue. And so what, what you notice is that the new candidate is um, the new point, the accepted point, is <coughs> the, um, the new candidate if this is satisfied or the old candidate if it's not, and that means you continue the loop. So um, alternatively, you can write the transitional probability at each time. This is essentially what the canonical Boltzmann sampling is that the transitional probability is 1 if the energy is less than or equal to 0, the energy difference, and it's this factor if it's greater than or equal to 0. And in such a way, you can generate the um, correct probability so that um, this is essentially what your acceptance is. It's the minimum of this uh, factor here where this is the probability density. Um, here. So in other words, this is a method that's very Im useful because um, it allows the energy to increase as well as decrease in, in minimization methods that, that are implemented, the local minimization methods. We always go downhill, and that's why they're often called greedy descent methods. Um, but in Monte Carlo, by allowing the energy to increase, you can jump from different um, and, of course, there's many extensions that you all know, the simulated annealing that mimics a physical process of cooling metals, and you gradually lower the temperature. The, the temperature, of course, enters in the Boltzmann factor. So um, by changing that, you can mimic a process that will tend toward the equilibrium <coughs> of the structure. And besides um, sampling per se, Monte Carlo methods, Metropolis Monte Carlo invariants, can be used for global optimization methods and uh, for crystallography or NMR model refinements in, um, in order to um, refine the structure and uh, relax different, uh, cons different uh, steric clashes and so on. Um, I want to mention an important application to non-Boltzmann sampling. And that's umbrella sampling. And that's um, a very important technique that's often used in, in free energy calculations. And essentially, um, it's a procedure to bias a given uh, Monte Carlo trajectory so that you generate another one um, that's related to it in some way, in, in a way that you sample a rare event. So the idea is if you have a, a starting trajectory, you select a perturbing parameter. So for example, um, imagine you're, you're sampling a, a transition, let's say the sugar of DNA, and the uh, pseudorotation angle, if, if you were to do a Monte Carlo or a, a molecular dynamics simulation, would focus on, on uh, regions that are reserved for DNA. But let's say you want to get a complete map, the free energy of that entire sugar as a function of that variable. So you have to sample these unfavored regions, for example, where the uh, unfavored sugar orientations. So you start from what you have and you perturb the parameter. In this case, it might be the, the sugar uh, pseudorotation variable and force the system by incremental moves by adding a constraint term um, and with respect to the biasing potential, and then observing that, generating a probability at each window of this perturbation, and after that, by taking the natural minus the natural log of that probability, you can estimate the free energies, and then you generate a continuous curve by connecting those, those windows. And of course, um, in order for this technique to work, um, the free energy must, must vary by small amounts of order kT. Otherwise, um, otherwise, it will not be accurate. So this is a very um, simplistic way. There are a lot of details associated with umbrella sampling, but 
essentially that's a non-Boltzmann sampling that's very important in um, practice. Um, so here's a simulation, an example of a calculation of pi, which you can all try um, that to, to just use a very simple program to, to calculate pi. And essentially what you're doing is you're integrating points. So imagine just throwing darts at a quarter of a circle and then um, and using the area that you've captured in, in the limit of many, many darts over here and using the, the relation of the area of a quarter of that circle. So essentially, um, you are simulating in, in, in this program this, this kind of integral, this double integral um, f g dx dy where f of x, y is one if you hit um, inside the unit circle zero elsewhere and uh, g of x is y is if your uh, x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to one. This is the mathematical interpretation of this and all you do is uh, you have a random seed, you have a random number generator, you set um, x to be a random number, y to be a random number, you compute the square root of the sum x squared plus y squared and then if it lies in, um, in the circle, then you consider <coughs> that a candidate, um, another item in your average. If not, you continue and then you simply average the uh, sum over the, you multiply by four to get that. So that's how you get r, uh, you get have pi, sorry, r is one and uh, this is uh, the result, can give you uh, pi quite accurately and here are just different random number generators that, that I'll talk about what they give um, but uh, some, this one in particular you could see is very bad um, although you've got to keep in mind that we're talking about very uh, the third or fourth digit over there but, um, but even for something very simple the quality of a random number generator can be important. Um, Okay, so I'd like to turn now to the second half of this first lecture and just give you a few uh, tips on random number uh, generators. This, I at the time that I was actually writing um, the chapter in the book on random number generator, I was um, sometimes in when I used to get um, tired of writing and working on the book, so I used to look at cartoons, um, especially Dilbert. And this was, this was, uh, this appeared in um, that, that same time that I was writing about random number generator and I considered it a, um, a sign that I should continue. But uh, if you, you are familiar with Dilbert, uh, they, um, he, th this guy, I think it's, um, this was a special guest, I don't remember this guy's name. Um, but he comes and he's showing this, uh, the office and he says, over here we have a random number generator, nine, nine, and he's showing the, the uh, product that this spews. And uh, are you sure that that's random? That's a problem with randomness. You can never be sure. Um, so, of course, uh, for us, for scientists, that's not an option to just trust the uh, numbers that they give us. And um, unfortunately, that, that turns, uh, it turns to be true that, that it's very hard to, with the naked eye and in many cases even for um, experts in this field to detect a good random number generator or detect artifacts. Um, but, but that's why a large field, a large battery of tests have been developed to address this question. Um, so of course, uh, random number generators are essential as you saw. All Monte Carlo methods rely on random number generators and many other things in uh, connection, Langevin dynamics for example, um, to set the, the, the heat bath, the random force. You're using that a lot in molecular simulations and not only are you using um, you're using them as many as iterations. In each iteration you might need 
uh, a vector of random number generator, uh, of, of random numbers. So uh, you can quickly run out of the period of this generator, and I'll, I'll define what that means. So therefore, the quality of the, the random number generator is important. So of course, um, the real name should be pseudorandom because, um, because it's not random. We can repeat that. And um, there, there are attempts, uh, there, there are methods to use purely random and um, in, in more random than pseudorandom, let me say that. Um, but but they're, not, um, they're not typically used. So the idea is very simple, that you have a number, um, you, you have one number, and you have perhaps a series of its predecessors, and from that, that number you produce <coughs> a new random number. So you have um, some kind of function that takes you from the prior number of the prior series to the new random number generator. So a good random number generator should be fast and efficient on both serial and parallel machines. And this is, was really a problem in the old days. Now, since we've become so ambitious in our applications, um, the, the, the time of the random number generator is, is very minor. But nonetheless, um, keep it in mind when you're using accessing it very often. It should have passed a battery of statistical tests for randomness, and it technically, um, or in theory, you should test that it works appropriately with the algorithm. There have been many interesting studies of particular random number generators that when you use uh, in combination with applications, for example, the Ising model in physics, where you determine the flip, the spin, uh, up and down, um, of particles that you can, um, there are subtle correlations between the application and the random number generator. So it's important to test them as a pair, if at all possible. And today, we have experts who have worked out um, beautiful and techniques for a very long period. And, and the period is the cycle um, the the cycle length of a random number generator so that um, only after two to the 200 numbers you'd start to repeat itself. So um, it's important to have a, as long a period as possible and there are techniques to have uh, two to the 200, two to the 400 uh, depending on the machine and typical um, Old, uh, uh, let's say old ones, when, when I first started um, to, to work on large event dynamics and look at the charm um, random number generator, this was the period um, 2 to the 30th, and that's much too short. Um, not only that, it's an old random number generator that's known to have serious defects, and I'll, I'll show you that. So, um, so there we, we implemented uh, um, we incorporated a better one, so it should be available. Um, but of course, that it keeps changing the field. Um, the experts d keep developing longer and, and better random number generators. So uh, it's always important if you're going to do a, a significant Monte Carlo simulation to check with your resident uh, uh, computer scientist. Um, so the, the basic requirements for random numbers are independence. In other words, they shouldn't be correlated, so that, that's just um, obvious. They should be uniformly distributed over 0, 1, and that's actually the most difficult aspect because most random number generators do not give you a uniform distribution. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, nice pictures. Um, or ugly pictures, actually, because you'll see that, that the sampling is not complete and you concentrate on certain periods, uh, regions. And of course, as I mentioned, the long period, we'd like to have a sequence so that the sequence repeats itself over a very long tau. Um, however, subtle correlations are difficult to avoid. Even the best random number generators have them. Um, so you, you at least have to, um, have to know know what they are, and uh, 
the, there are cases where the sequence period can be related to a variable in the problem, and I'll mention this classic uh, Linpath problem where they found this, this uh, round-off error that shouldn't have been so bad in random matrices. And it, the problem turned out to be that the sequence period was correlated with the matrix order. Um, random number generators should be portable so that you could implement them on different machines, different compilers, so that you can repeat a simulation and um, not, not be like the uh, Dilbert character. Um, and they should be efficient. And as I said, if you're going to use a vector of random numbers, you should have a routine that um, specifies a random a, a random vector rather than calling the random number generator for every entry in the vector. Okay, so the simplest uh, type of random number generators are linear congruential generators. And they have a very simple formula. So you have Xi, that's the uh, prior candidate. And um, it, so the recursion relation, you only, you define xi plus 1 only from the prior estimate. Um, and that's, you multiply a, a xi by a, that's the multiplier. And you add a, a increment c to it, c can be 0. And then you take the result mod m, and that gives you the new candidate. Uh, and then you divide that value by m to get a, number between um, 0 and 1. So m should be a large positive number. That's the modulus. a is known as the multiplier, and c is the increment. And when c is 0, you just have um, this, this, uh, this value a xi mod m, and that's a, a multiplicative uh, linear congruential generator. So here's an example, very, very simple example so you could work it out, that you have um, m is 11. This is a, just a very small number, it's just to illustrate it. And uh, c is 0, and uh, a is different here. I, this is a typo. Um, and so when you have different values, of, you could just uh, work it out. So if a equals 2, and you start from 1, so the, the um, x x0 is 1, um, 2 times 1, that's 2, mod 11, that gives you 2. Uh, then you do 2 times 2, that's 4, mod 11, you get 4, and so on. That's how you get the sequence. Now, because m is 11, the longest uh, sequence length that you can get is 10. So these, only in these four cases, when a um, the multiplier is eight, is, is two, six, seven, or eight, do you get the full sequence period? If it's not chosen like that, then you have, in, in the case if, if A is 10, you just have 110, 110, 110. So it illustrates uh, a very, um, th the problem from, in, in a very simple example, but nonetheless, these things occur in, um, in, realistic generators. So here's just um, an illustration. Note that in this case, these I've plotted here um, the what's called the correlation plots, so pairs, consecutive pairs in the random number generator sequence. And these are all the, the, the four values of A that give full length sequences. And if you plot those pairs, you could already see, even in this very simple, the sampling is far from random, they all lie on these lattice, what's called lattice points. And in some cases, these are worse than, than these. So um, that already you know that you have a non-uniform sampling. Okay, so that was a very simple example. But if you look at um, a typical generator that you might have. Um, this was the Microsoft Fortran Power Station's random number generator, random. And uh, here, the, the period, um, the, this is the lattice structure that you get from, this is a uh, zooming of, the, of a particular region of the unit 
circle, a unit square, sorry, but you can already see that you have a pattern and this is exactly what we want to avoid because we want our sampling to be random and, uh, and uniform. And so these missing points will never be sampled because, um, because of the structure of this generator. And uh, actually an infamous um, multiplicative linear congruential generator is, is called SURAND and it was developed uh, by IBM in, in 1960s and that's the one that uh, has, has been used. That's, that's the one I said that, that Charm had and many other. And it has a, a known lattice structure that is a defective sampling that, that I'll show you the picture of. And um, uh, if you try to implement this by a naive implementation, just multiply a number by the prior estimate, um, add the multiplier, get uh, and then do mod m, uh, you can have overflow. So I just want to emphasize that the typical implementation is far, is far more complex than the, the simple statement you've seen because you have to avoid overflow in the temporary um, variables that are computed. And there are sophisticated ways to actually multiply and divide and, and implement this kind of formula without, um, to avoid that. Um, and there's another one that's, that's also known in the Sun Unix library, DRAND48, um, which is this generator. And uh, it's also very simple, but it also has a known um, lattice structure. So I'm just going to end by showing some, some pictures of lattice structures that, that were studied by various people. And these are actually very sophisticated random number generators. And um, the colors correspond to different uh, um, lags. So the lags, instead of um, doing lag xi and xi plus 1, you can have a lag of 2, xi, xi plus 2, and so on. And there are um, frightening patterns that emerge from even these very good random number generator. In some cases, actually very beautiful patterns um, like this. Um, now, this is the type that you'd like to aim. So this is what, what you'd like something to be um, uniform, to look random, to be complete. And, um, and there are many examples of good patterns and implementations on massively parallel machines and this reference, for example, um, <coughs> that, um, that you can look that's cited in your um, references. And I just want to mention that there are other generators besides those very simple for, um, multiplicative uh, linear congruential generators that I described. Um, Many other techniques by more sophisticated techniques using lag Fibonacci series, uh, shift register, many other more complicated. But the, the, it turns out that in order to have a, a, a good quality random numbers generator, um, you can shuffle various ones. So you, if, if you take four of them, you saw that even some of the best ones give you a kind of lattice structure. But if you take four of them and then shuffle them in a clever way, um, you can get a sequence that's much longer than, e than the individuals and that you can um, avoid some of the artifacts. Um, and that's how you can generate these very large um, uh, periods for the random number generator. So I strongly recommend any of you that want to study this, this um, this field, just go to Pierre Lecouillet's uh, website in uh, Montreal, and um, he's, I think, the world one of the world leaders in this area, and he he always has um, a, a, a great handy number generators for whatever you need. Um, so I just want to now end by saying that that 
often you need Gaussian random numbers or other, uh, you need to sample numbers from other distributions. Uh, so far we've only gotten uniform distribution, but it turns out that it's very easy and you could use those um, random, uniform random variates to generate any kind of distributions that you want and there are formulas and classic books. Um, but typically in molecular applications, we also need Gaussian variants. So um, the idea is, is here, this is the, the Gaussian for so simply from the um, integral of the normal distribution over here, the idea is to pick, uh, you set the, um, the uniform um, random number is u, then you can estimate this is what your goal is to get a per this x of u, and this is a formula of getting it essentially by evaluating this, expanding this in, in a series, and uh, these are uh, polynomials of degree four that yield a desired approximation accuracy, and uh, more popular perhaps is the Bo box muller Marcellio method um, that you can actually get from two uniform random numbers, u1, u2, you, uh, you get uh, v1 and v2 in this range, minus one to one, and then you compute x1 by this and x2 by that, and um, this is if, if the, qu the, the quantity is here, and essentially you get the, um, the random numbers uh, over here, and uh, x1 and x2, and essentially you're evaluating by this technique the joint uh, probability distribution in this way, so you're generating two Gaussian variates from the two uniform variates, again from the uh, formula of the normal uh, distribution. Um, and finally, I just want to mention that you should be aware of correlations between your algorithm and the random number generators. And this is the example I wanted to mention um, of uh, 19, in 1989 when um, they were benchmarking LINPAC with its important um, program in linear algebra routines. And David Howe was generating these random matrices in order to test their Gaussian elimination. And he was generating matrices that are 512 by 512. And there was a perplexing underflow of 10 to the minus 40 very quickly um, in, in the matrices of these dimensions. And of course, random matrices are supposed to be well conditioned, so they are not supposed to give these kind of errors. Um, but there were no such bugs in uh, matrices that were 100 uh, by 100 or uh, of dimension 300 or even 1,000 in single precision. Um, so what, what was the problem? Well, it turned out this was several, um, it was interesting because this was diagnosed by email, this was uh, the first kind of email chat groups that, that began in, in the um, 80s and, and it was, was solved in a series of emails which I, which I kept because it was so fascinating. Um, so the, the, the problem turned out that there was, uh, they used the random number generator, a very simple one that had um, this, uh, this multiplier and uh, this, uh, this value of A, and the period turned out to be not even a, a full period of M, but a period of M over four, and it turns out that the period of the random number generator divides the matrix dimension. So essentially what you had when you had a, a, a matrix that's 512 um, columns, you would repeat the random matrix 16 times. So it wasn't random at all, it just repeated perfectly. And therefore, uh, after 32 steps of Gaussian elimination, you already have um, the upper, A0 is already upper triangular um, in the elimination and you have an order, an underflow like that and it keeps 
growing very quickly and that's why so there are very simple fixes to this but but it shows that because of these subtle correlations you can have these artifacts ok so then the final summary is here that you have to take precautions and check your algorithm with a random number generators and there are a couple interesting paper on 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 these subtle correlations and the best advice is really to uh, use a high quality random number generator you might want to experience experiment with more than one and um, always ask your your resident uh, computer scientist so just I'll end by showing these uh, these pictures of these random number generators that I mentioned that were that had flaws in them like uh, DRAN48, RAN, these are the simple ones and um, that I bet you some of you here are using every day and um, they have these these artifacts that um, that you that are frightening when actually they're they're plotted in um, and examined. So um, I think I finished right on time so I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you. I'm wondering if there is a, such a severe problem with random generators, why don't you use only a like a Miller indicator which is brought to a web server as a random number server like a time server and used from everybody? You could record so you numbers and give a vector then if you need more than one and you had no problem with sudden algorithms. Well, I, I, I think there are people working on what I said, what more random type, uh, type um, generators, but there's, been, there's problems with those too as well um, because if you have system crashes or other things, so it, nothing is foolproof. But these, I should vote that these are so easy to implement and, um, and you just have to be aware. Maybe I, I've just introduced the, the possible, the caveats, but once you know them and there are, it's not hard. You can just download a good routine and it's very easy, it's very efficient and, um, and it works. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so in in DNA, and let me just backtrack. What we, we're talking about thousands of base pairs. We're not talking about the dodecamer level where molecular dynamics is very important and on the all atom resolution. So when we're talking, we're talking about long supercoiled molecules, and there you want to study their properties. In, in that length when you are much longer than a persistence length, these molecules are very floppy. So, um, and the solvent has profound influence on, on the structures. So there is no um, equilibrium structure per se. There is an equilibrium ensemble. So what our goal is um, in these type of calculations is to look at structural properties. So for example, you change the salt concentration in the environment and you want to see what is the average number of branching in these kinds of DNAs. Um, what is the writhing number? These are uh, geometric characteristics of uh, the writhing and the number of self-crossings of a long DNA. Um, we are also interested in things that are called site juxtaposition, which is um, tells you this is important for recombination. So if you have a long DNA, um, what is the the rate that um, that two points along the DNA that are distant in sequence will be close in space? So, for example, the average time if you you know residue one and residue two fifty five to come within 100 angstrom of each other. So these are things where you need 
uh, Monte Carlo simulations to generate a large ensemble, and then you need to average different properties. But again, the properties may not be one area of phase space, and, and that's where Monte Carlo and Brownian dynamics are very important. Yeah, that you never do. That, that's, that's the real answer. Um, you, you never do, but of course, um, what, what you should do is um, do what you can to address this question. Um, for example, try an ensemble that's double. Double is large. Are your uh, properties converging? Um, uh, those are basic, basic uh, tests for correlations in your data. Um, so th that's a typical question. For example, now we're in our group, we're studying transition path sampling method, Chandler's um, method, and <coughs> that's where you combine Monte Carlo trajectories and um, as, as well as molecular dynamics. And, and that's where the problem is particularly acute because um, we hope within our sampling that we've done um, to have covered all the interesting transition state regions. That's what we aim in these methods. Um, but you never know. So all you could do is extend trajectories, and there are clever ways to shift and shifting moves of Monte Carlo trajectory. So if you, you have a trajectory that you think is an interesting region, you could use shifting move um, and see whether it takes you to a completely re a different region of phase space. So um, in, in this context, what we do is once we have identified the important regions of phase space, then we, we try to deviate from them in the possible ways and then to, to get an estimate of your convergence. So um, it's, unfortunately, it's only heuristic that you could address this. Yeah, um, so I think, I think there were two questions. One appears to be how do you define the moves, the perturbation moves, and that's a very tricky question. Uh, the other question is what's the utility of Monte Carlo methods in looking at large systems? Well, um, the, the let me answer the first one. Uh, the first one about the perturbation, you are right. It's, it's, it takes a lot of, it's an art to how to perturb the atoms. And typically you uh, perturb uh, one atom at a time, sometimes several, but it's a very slow process. You're obviously sampling in some, some way. But um, in general, I agree, it. Monte molecular dynamics is a very important technique, and that's, that's essentially what we use, too, in our lab for studying uh, details of, of, uh, of large macromolecular systems. But um, it has a severe limitation of sampling, so that even um, if your simulation is long and long in the molecular dynamics uh, community is 10 nanosecond or or maybe by, by typical techniques, by extreme techniques, uh, we have simulations that are microsecond long. But even those are of small system, and even those really go to one region of space. So you never um, really get information about other possible regions. And this severe sampling problem is really um, um, important in many applications. And even in the protein folding, there's now very recently these arguments of, of pathways that some of these simulations, long simulations, may be biasing the, the pathways and, and therefore biasing the end product. So Monte Carlo methods are a way to um, overcome that and uh, sample space more broadly. 
And that's why I mentioned that the hybrid Monte Carlo and um, molecular dynamics and Brownian dynamics, they try to take the best of both worlds. So the detailed local sampling of molecular dynamics with a more broad sampling of these stochastic type methods. And that will be a challenge for the next decade. I can only emphasize this. Uh, in molecular dynamics, you use for hypothesis testing mainly. You must be pretty brain dead to use it for sampling. So you use a cluster or you will for sampling phase space. Uh, OK. Um, well, what I could tell you, I've only, um, I haven't used or had any experience myself, but from, from what I understand from the literature, um, it's, it's hard to develop methods that, that are really used in applications. Um, maybe um, there are many techniques, there are many hybrid Monte Carlo ideas, and, and as I said, the basic idea is to exploit the best of both worlds. Um, but as far as applying them to m real molecular problems, I haven't seen much of that literature um, because in, for those problems, probably you know you could use technique either technique by its own. So um, I think they're at a, a development stage, and there there are many papers, um, and I could give you some references on on reviews in that area. No, you know, in theory you could do anything. You could do angles, any internal variables. Yes, it just turns out to be easy to, to move Cartesian coordinates. Yes. Um, yeah, all I could say is that, that indeed I mentioned that there could be subtle correlations between the random number generator and, and their examples in the paper that I mentioned, the, uh, the Ising model, that, that the, the random number generator was very high quality, and yet the way it, it um, interacted with the, uh, the physical simulation that was being done, it was causing these artifacts. So uh, therefore, I recommended that you know if you're really relying and if you're publishing numbers that come from these simulations, try different random number generators. And in the case of the Ising model paper, they showed that actually a simple random number generator with a, a shorter period and this gave a much better result. So it's um, not likely going to happen, but. Practitioners should be aware and take precautions where possible. Okay, so before we go for the break, let's negotiate to give you 25 minutes to remind you and get you back. And also, the book of Karma will be available. Um, uh, it, will be, it will be on the desk outside. And you have an opportunity to talk to uh, uh, Karma Shukla. Dr. Shukla is